The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome to worship with First Presbyterian Church. Whether you are here with us in person or you are worshiping online with us, we are so glad that you've decided to join us today. I invite you to join us in our call to worship, which you'll find in, printed in your bulletin. I invite you to please stand. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, for you, O Lord, have made us glad by your work. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do sing for joy because of everything that you have done, everything that you have created, everything that you have created us to be. We give you thanks and praise for your power, for your glory. But most of all, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the grace you have shown us, searching us out, bringing us back into relationship with you because of what your son Jesus has done for us. And so we give you thanks and praise during this time of worship, and we ask that your spirit would be poured into us so that we might be strengthened to be your people and to show forth your glory in the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We pray now a prayer of confession, lifting our confession to God, confessing that there are indeed ways that we have not lived up to our calling as God's people and seeking his grace. Let us pray together the prayer of confession found printed in your bulletin or upon the screen. Let us pray. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy on us. Return us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us take a moment of silent confession to make this prayer our own as we come before God individually confessing our sins. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. People of God, hear this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We are indeed a grateful people, a thankful people to our God for God's grace, and it gives us a joy that we bring to worship. Let us share that joy with one another. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. And I also want to invite any kids that we have, or those of you who just have a hard time seeing, we've got, some, we've got one or two benches up here. So if you want to come up and see what's going on as we do this baptism this morning, come on up. You are welcome. If you're young at heart, that works too. Well, it is our privilege this morning to celebrate the sacrament of baptism for Lucas Foster Chiswick, Jr., 
Jesus said, these words, I have been given complete authority in heaven and on earth. Zion, you can come on up too. <laughs> I've been given complete. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, it's all fine. I have been given complete authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go to all people everywhere and make them my disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. So obeying the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to him. In baptism, we give thanks for the children and grandchildren of those who believe, and we welcome them into the family of faith. And so know that the promises of God are for you and for your children and for your grandchildren, and remember with joy your own baptism as we celebrate the sacrament this morning. On behalf of the session, I present Lucas Foster Chiswick, Jr., son of Lucas and Grace Chiswick, and grandson of Rob and Sue Hess, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Lucas and Grace, in presenting your son for baptism, you announce your own faith in Jesus Christ, and you demonstrate that you want your son to know Christ, to love him, and to serve him as his chosen disciple. And so let me ask you these questions. Do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you promise in reliance upon God's grace to set before Lucas an example of the new life in Christ? Do you promise to pray with and for Lucas and to bring him up in the knowledge and the love of God? And now to the godparents and the grandparents. Do you promise to pray for Lucas and to support Luke and Grace as they raise him in the faith, demonstrating the love and care of our God to him always? Do you? All good. All good. It's just flowers. All good. Our Lord Jesus Christ commanded us to teach those who are baptized. Do we, as members of Christ's church, promise to guide and nurture Lucas by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to grow into the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to be a faithful member of his church? If so, please say, we do. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death. From it we are raised to share in his resurrection. Through it we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so send your Holy Spirit, we pray, so that this water might be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it. Raise them to new life and graft them into the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on them so that they may have the power to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you think, big guy? Yeah? All right. Lucas Foster, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Bless, O Lord, this child with your grace, that he may grow strong and blessed, and may one day confess you as his own Lord and Savior. We pray it in your name. Amen. Lucas Foster, child of the covenant, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Lucas Chiswick has been received into the universal church of Jesus Christ through baptism. God has made him a member of the household of God to share with us in the grace and service of Jesus Christ. Let us welcome him. Let's give him a round of applause. You want to see everybody? Lucas, for you, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, Jesus died and conquered sin and death. And he did this all for you, even though you don't know anything about it yet. 
but he did it all for you. These promises that we celebrate each and every week and that we celebrate today, they are because of what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And what we have done is we have marked you, claimed those promises for you, and said that they are true for you just like they are true for your parents and your grandparents and all the generation of those who have believed who has come before you. And so we pray that God would continue to bless you in the Chiswick family as you continue to go grow in God's grace. Amen. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's the certificate. All right. What's next? All right. I get to do the next one. Yep. Well, as if that wasn't exciting enough, we do have a few things that are coming up that I want to share with you, a few announcements. Uh, Julie is on vacation today, and we're really glad to have Eric at the piano today. Thank you, Eric. Once again, we're, we're at that point where our announcements fit on, on one page, which is really great because you can take that and just stick it on your refrigerator at home and know what's coming up. But we want to say thank you to the Rothera family and to the Edwards family for these beautiful flowers, and you can read more about the dedication that was given there. Also, in uh, your, your uh, pew back, you'll find an envelope for one great hour of sharing. One great hour in sharing is a denominational offering that we take up each year. It goes to support all kinds of things. You can read more about what that supports, but they are wonderful programs that go and do the work of Jesus Christ in our community and around the world to help folks. And so we do ask that you consider making an offering to one great hour of sharing. We do have opportunities for you to continue to engage in growing your own faith during this time of Lent as we prepare ourselves for the miracle of Easter and the empty tomb. And so we invite you to come, whether it is on Sunday mornings, uh, to our class right here that's immediately following worship. Today we'll be looking at the Last Supper and the, the final discourse that Jesus gives to his disciples as we consider the final week of Jesus' life and how that informs our faith and how we live as his disciples. And also on Wednesday evenings, Pastor Doug is leading us in a class, The Grace of Les Mis. If you love that novel or that musical or that movie, we invite you to come and to to study that. It is a wonderful novel that is just jam-packed with Christian themes that can help us live as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. On the back, you'll see our schedule for Easter and Holy Week. I would invite you to pray about who can you invite to come and experience the joy of Easter and the, the seriousness of Holy Week, that solemnness that invites us to celebrate Maybe there's somebody in your life that you could invite to come and to join us. You can see more information about our services there, um, but we are excited as we are getting ready for Easter. One final thing is that we are continuing on with our children's program. So it's not a joke, I promise. On Friday, April 1st, April Fool's Day, we are going to have children's programming here from 6 to 8. If you are a parent or grandparent or guardian and you want to to bring a child, you can bring them. I promise they're going to have a great time, and you go enjoy an, an evening while we take care of the kids. Now let's continue with our worship, which is me. <clears throat> I'm our worship. All right. Well, let's pray one more time. Gracious God, meet us now as we come to the reading and preaching of your word. However we find ourselves this morning, however we have entered into this place, meet us, we pray. Some of us are here and we have heard that voice in our own heads or we've heard the voice of others when they have told us that we are damaged goods, that we are too far gone. And we have internalized that message and we, we live with a sense of shame and we believe that this gospel is good news for other people but that quite frankly it just isn't good enough for us. 
Some of us are here today, and quite frankly, we have had our lives turned upside down by this good news of your grace. The moment we met you, the moment we experienced your grace, our lives were never the same, and we have never stopped living with joy and amazement of all the things you have done for us. Meet us, we pray. Some of us are here today, and whether we have grown up in the church for, for years or whether we are new to this, we just aren't sure what grace really is. Meet us. However we find ourselves this morning, however we have entered into this place, help us to believe that you see us. You see us where we are. You see us for who we are. You see us in the complexity of our lives that we are both beautiful and yet we are broken. You see us and where the world sees mess, you see opportunity and so you run towards us in renewing, redeeming, self-sacrificial love. Give us grace to believe that, we pray. Amen. Well, we talk about grace a lot, don't we? Right, each week in our worship service, we talk about it. We, we sing about amazing grace. We, we come to this table and we feast on grace and we drink it in. We bathe in grace at this font. The second word of our worship service every week is grace. We confess that we are saved by grace. We believe that in Jesus Christ we have received grace upon grace. We talk a lot about grace. Do you know, as often as we talk about grace, grace strikes me as one of those things that it is incredibly difficult to define. You know, it's such a big idea that I think it's, it's difficult for us to, to wrap our arms around the idea of grace, much less the wrap our heads around an idea that is that big. And that's a real problem. And it's a problem because that difficulty in defining and understanding grace means that we can talk about grace a lot and we can labor under the assumption that we all know what we're talking about and actually have absolutely no idea what grace means. That, that was my own experience in church. I grew up in the church. My mom and I were founding members of a church in our hometown. I was in Sunday school just about every week. I knew my Bible well. But it wasn't until my mid-twenties that I could tell you what grace was. And, and even then, the only way that I could explain to you what grace was is that I could point to a story from Scripture and I could say, that's grace. That, that's what grace looks like. Now, he was talking about something completely different from grace, but... The point still applies. Um, when Justice Potter Stewart said, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it, that is true about grace too. We may not know how to define it, but I think we know what grace is when we see it. We know what grace looks like, even if we can't put that into words. And, and I think Jesus struggled with this too, this problem of how to define grace, because when people asked Jesus to define grace, he didn't give them a definition. He told them a story. And that story is our passage for today. It is a long passage, but it is the definition of, of grace. So let's listen now to God's word from the 15th chapter of Luke as we see what grace looks like. Let's listen now for God's word. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. 
the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and he traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went, and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. He sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And so he set off. And he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this story, one that many of us, maybe even most of us, probably know by heart, is a picture of how God's grace works. If somebody were to ask us what's grace, there's not a much better answer we could give than to simply read them the story. Do you know this story does more than show us what grace is? It also shows us what grace isn't. It shows us the ways that we misunderstand grace. Because grace is so difficult for us to define and it is so difficult for us to understand, I find that we frequently have misunderstandings about what grace is and how grace works and what that means for those of us who proclaim the good news of of God's grace for the world made real in Jesus Christ is that we actually misunderstand our own gospel. And what we see from this story is is that when we misunderstand grace, when we misunderstand grace, we actually do it in ways that limit its ability to transform lives. 
Most often, when we misunderstand the good news of God's grace, we misunderstand God's grace in a way that makes it less good. And this story tells us the two ways that we misunderstand God's grace. We we might make the mistake of the older son. When we think of grace as a zero-sum game, meaning that we think of grace a bit like it's a pie, where if you get a slice of this grace pie, there is less pie for me. There's less grace available for me. We think that if somebody else were to receive the Father's love, that somehow we are going to miss out on that love. And when we live our lives this way, we miss out on the fact that God's grace and love are inexhaustible resources. When we make the mistake of the older son, we put limits on how far God's grace can reach, both in the way that it reaches out to other people, and we tell ourselves that we are up beyond the reach of God's grace too. And at the same time, we also walk around believing that we are somehow entitled to this grace. We think we're entitled to a certain amount of this grace because we have followed all of the rules. We have done everything the way that we're supposed to do it, that on the whole, quite frankly, our lives are not that bad. At least I am better than that guy over there. And so when we see someone who we don't think deserves grace receive it, We end up living our lives tinged with with resentment and envy and anger. And you know what? It's actually more dangerous than that because when we make this mistake of of thinking that somehow the, the measure of grace that we receive is somehow tied to our own achievement, we will inevitably fall short of what we think is required to receive God's grace. And we fall into a cycle of resentment and despair and bitterness. You know, maybe some of you have fallen into this pattern of thinking that that you need to get yourself cleaned up before you can come back and dare to ask for the grace that you need. And you work, and you work, and you work, and you find that you never measure up to that threshold that you might need in order to even begin to think about asking for grace. And so what ends up happening is is that you never end up making your way back to that place where grace is found. That's the mistake of the older son. We might make the mistake of the younger son, where we think that we're too far gone for God's grace to do us any good. The younger son returns back home, and he doesn't think that he could ever be received or accepted back into his father's household. What he thinks is is that somehow through his own sin his own failure, that he's been able to lose his sonship, that he has permanently severed that relationship that exists between him and his father. His highest hope in coming home is that he could be treated as a hired hand in his father's house. He has experience living as a hired hand. It didn't go so well for him. That's the best he could hope for, though. 
He never dreamed that he could be accepted back home as a son. He never believed in a million years that that grace could restore him to what he once was. That in an instant, grace could break through everything that stood in the way of a restored and reconciled relationship between a father and his son. And while he doesn't deserve it, he has done nothing to earn it. And there is no good reason in the world for his father to take him back. It is the surprising truth and good news that it is the father's joy It is the Father's joy and delight to welcome him back home to his place as a son. The mistake of the younger son is to say that grace might be available for you and for everyone else. God may love you and everyone else. God may have accepted you and reclaimed you as God's own beloved son or daughter. but that's not enough for me. I need more. When we make the mistake of the younger son, we place ourselves beyond the reach of God's grace and we say that somehow we have placed ourselves, that we have placed ourselves by our own power that is beyond God's own power and determination to save us. What we're saying is is that God's power isn't enough. God's grace isn't enough. God's love isn't enough. God's mercy isn't enough. It might be good enough for everyone else, but it's not good enough for me. What we're saying is is that somehow our power to sin is greater than God's power, which is unleashed in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God's power to save and heal us and our world. We're saying that we're more powerful than God. Do you see how this mistake of the younger son on its face sounds Incredibly humble. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what's happened to me. You don't know how badly I have been wounded, how broken I am. I'm too far gone. Do you see how that sounds? Humble. But it is the height of arrogance because we are placing ourselves in a position where we know better than what God is able to do with us. We are putting ourselves in a position where we are more powerful than God himself. These mistakes, the mistake of the older son, the mistake of the younger son, Jesus says that's what grace doesn't look like. But then Jesus tells us what grace does look like. Grace begins at the moment we come to ourselves, we come to our senses. And we make that first step to return home. Grace runs out to meet us because it has been waiting and watching for us. And it runs out to meet us and embraces us without question or reservation. Grace restores us to dignity and confirms our identity as God's beloved children. Grace refuses to deal with us as we deserve. And it exceeds our wildest hopes and dreams. 
And God delights. It is God's deepest joy to lavish grace upon us. It's his joy and delight to welcome us home. Friends, that's what grace looks like. And it's good news. Let's pray. Gracious God, this good news of your grace, it sounds too good to be true. That you might receive us despite what we have done, despite what's been done to us, despite what we have neglected to do, that you might receive us with open arms and embrace us as your beloved child. It seems too good to be true that that you would not begrudge receiving us back into your presence, but that your delight and joy would be receiving us back. That there, you throw a party when we return. That's, that's how glad you are. We're not used to news that good, Lord. Lord, give us grace to believe that that good news might be true. That it might be true not just for everyone around us, that it might not just be true for the world around us, but that it would actually be true for us. And as a result, Lord, would it transform our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the ways that God's grace meets us is in the ministry of healing. God, our God, is a God of healing. A God that can take any brokenness, any illness, anything within us, and give us the grace to heal. That phrase, there is grace sufficient for thee. Grace sufficient. That means that we claim this powerful promise of God's healing even when the world says there's no hope. We believe there's healing that God can do even when the doctors say there's nothing else we can do. We believe that there's a healing that can take place even in the midst of grief, even when we've lost someone we love even when a relationship has been broken for many years and reconciliation seems impossible, even when we find ourselves caught in a mess of addiction, of sin, whatever has trapped us, we believe there is grace sufficient there, that God's healing can find us there. So if you, this morning, would like prayers for healing, I would invite you to come forward. It can be any kind of healing, a physical ailment. It can be a relationship in your life that is broken and needs reconciliation. It can be a mental illness that you struggle with or an addiction. It can be a spiritual healing that needs to take place. Whatever it is, whether you would come up for yourself or for someone you know and care about, we invite you to come up at this time if you would like prayers for healing. If you are an elder or a deacon in our congregation, if you are someone that feels that you have a spiritual gift for healing or for intercessory prayer, 
or frankly, if you just feel called to come up and lay a hand on someone that has come forward, I invite you to come forward and do so at this time. And if you remain seated, I invite you to lift up those who have come forward in prayer. I invite you to think of someone outside these church walls that is in need of God's healing and to offer up prayers for them. Let us be in a mind and heart of prayer. I got it. Let us pray together the prayer for healing found printed in your bulletin and upon the screen. Let us pray. Gracious God, source of all healing, in Jesus Christ you heal the sick and mend the broken. Hear our prayers. We support those who come seeking your loving care. May they know your healing touch in body, mind, spirit, and be made strong in you the glory of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. What are the ways that we, what are the ways that we share in the love and grace of Jesus Christ is by giving of our tithes and offerings. And so, we do that knowing that through these gifts, God is able to do the work of grace and reconciliation in the world, empowered by these gifts of time and treasure. And so we invite our ushers to come forward as they collect our offering this morning.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we offer you these gifts. May they do your work in the world and find the mouths and lives and ministries that need the support the most. We pray that you call us again this morning to that work, to your kingdom building, to the offering of your grace, that this amazing grace that we have known, we would not just keep it for ourselves or revel in the joy of it, but share that joy with others. Share it with your world that this world may truly be transformed by the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we are mindful of healing this morning, we lift up those who came forward. We lift up loved ones, friends, acquaintances. We lift up other places in our world that we know need your healing desperately. We remember in prayer this morning these specific people, Carol, Elaine, Hannah, Paul, Sarah, Susan, Riley, Lindsay, family, and for those serving overseas. And Lord, we lift up these people and situations with just a word. We lift them up to you, either silently or aloud, knowing that you know how to minister in these situations. Lord, you hear our prayers, and by your grace, you listen, you answer, you work in and through us to bring about healing in our world, to bring about the sharing of your goodness, your love, and your grace. For we pray this all in the name of the one who showed us that grace in full, sufficient for every one of us. We pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, forever. Amen. Amen. We will stand, continue to sing. Sammy comes up and leads us. And again, so thankful to our choir director, Eric, for uh, filling in today and leading us in worship and music. Let's sing together. And this is Ben. <laughs> I, they did that switch while I wasn't looking. Thankful for Ben also leading us in piano this morning. You guys are pretty slick how you did that. Good work. Right. Let's continue to worship. Sweet the sound. 
take our failure, you take our weakness, you set your treasure in jars of clay, so take this heart, Lord, I'll be a vessel, the world to Grace and glory go together because grace searches us out. It takes us from the lowest points and restores us to the beloved children of God. That's how powerful grace is. And when our lives display the evidence of that grace at work, there is nothing more glorious. And so we go out into the world to display this grace and glory to give the world hope that this grace exists not just for us, but for the whole world. And so, go out knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit is with you and will remain with you always. Friends, go in God's peace. Amen. Amen.